So welcome everybody. Um, this is the rescheduled, as you know, monthly meeting for April 26th, now on May 3rd. And I appreciate everybody joining us today. I'm looking forward to this presentation by Malcolm. And we'll get to that in just a second. I just had a few announcements I wanted to say um, before introducing Mal. Um, we obviously thank you all for, for logging on and continuing to support us, uh, especially during the COVID-19 challenge that we're all facing. And uh, we're, we're, we're trying to be innovative and uh, we're resilient like all of you and appreciate your continued support. And uh, in that, in that vein, you know, we have our annual fund going on right now. We'd like to um, encourage you to please consider a donation to our 2020 annual fund if you are able to. We certainly appreciate your support and those of you that have already given, thank you. Um, as you know, also out there, our online plant sale is live and on our website. We are partnering with Beach Hollow Farms to offer a variety of bird-friendly native plants for your landscape. Order plants online by May 6th this week. Um, we'll have pickup on the morning of May 8th and May 9th at the Atlanta Audubon office. We'll have social distancing protocols in place so that you may safely pick up your plants and you can see our website for more information. We have Facebook Live Bird Walks, as many of you know, and thank you for joining us. Uh, the staff and some of our volunteer leaders continue to offer virtual bird walks via Facebook Live each Friday morning at 9 a.m. on Atlanta Audubon's Facebook page. These walks will continue until we can resume in-person walks. So we appreciate everybody tuning in on Friday morning and joining us. On Cinco de Mayo, Tuesday, May 5th at noon, we'll be offering an Ask Chippy virtual event on Facebook Live. So come ready with all your bird related questions and you can always submit questions in advance to ask chippy at atlantaaudubon.org. And I encourage you to go to our website and, and our Facebook page and look at other, our other videos and digital events in the works. Um, we're continuing to update that as we go. And uh, many kudos to our staff and, and especially Dottie for really, really uh, pulling together some uh, I think really, really helpful, helpful tools for everybody. All right, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, uh, Malcolm Hodges. Mal grew up in coastal Mississippi and has a BA in biology from Rice University and a master's in zoology from Mississippi State. He has worked for the Nature Conservancy in Georgia as an ecologist and land manager for 28 years. So really since 1992, his current interests are co conservation management of threatened biota in the Southeast US, lichen systematics, distribution and conservation in the Southeast, and just about anything to do with birds as uh, those of you that know. You know, Mal, I've known Mal for, for several years. Mal is, in my opinion, the finest ecologist in the Southeast for sure, um, maybe in North America, I think, I would certainly be in that camp. Um, it's been a pleasure to know Mal. Um, he's taught me a lot about conservation in the Southeast. And of course, uh, you know, those of you that know Mal and appreciate Mal, as good, of an, as, as good as he is as an ecologist, he's a better human being. And he lives on a small farm in Riverdale, Georgia with his partner, Keith, their dog, and too many chickens. So on that note, Mal, I'm gonna kick it to you. Thanks, Jared, that, that was too kind. I uh, appreciate that. Um, so I, I hope that, you know, this is the first time I've done one of these remotely. So we're, Keith and I are kind of foot petting our dog to keep her quiet, um, but she, you might hear her moaning a little bit here and there during the presentation. She likes to moan when she gets petted, um, but she doesn't bark in the house. So today I wanna talk about um, birds and fire, and that's something that's really important to me because um, I'm a fire practitioner for my work. I work for the Nature Conservancy, and you know, just about everybody who works managing land for TNC uh, deals with fire in some way. So I'm what's called an RxB2. I'm a prescribed fire burn boss type two, and that means I get to lead fire, so uh, and, and plan for fire. 
So, you know, I try to plan fire with birds in mind. And birds are really important to me, of course, as a lifelong birder. Um, so I thought this would be a great presentation. I actually developed this presentation for a GOS meeting a number of years ago, but uh, I dusted it off and, uh, and spruced it up a little bit and updated it for this uh, presentation. So I hope you enjoy it. Let's see if I can figure out how to change my slide now. Working on it. Not working. There we go. Takes a firm hand. Um, so in the Southeast, uh, we have some of the most biodiverse uh, places on the planet. It's, it's recognized now as a biodiversity hotspot um, by the UN. Um, you know, these, these, in this slide, you see some of the, this is a poster child for high biodiversity in the Southeast. These pitcher plant bogs are incredible meter by meter. They have some of the highest organismal diversity on the planet. Um, it's fairly two dimensional. Uh, it's all on the ground and that's uh, going to be a recurring theme in this slide talk, talking about ground cover, the things that live on the ground. Uh, plants, insects, birds, all the things that, that live within that, you know, a few feet of the ground. That's, that's where fire happens down here. And, and diversity and fire is what we're going to be talking about. So where does, how does, how do fires start? Well, for, since pretty much plants have been growing on land, they've been burning because lightning happens. And lightning sets fire to plants. When you have a blast of lightning hit the ground, very frequently it ignites plants. If it hits a tree and the tree is dead and there's dead wood, it can uh, cause the fire to start burning uh, in, the, in, the, in that dead punky wood. So here you see a slide of a lightning frequency map. Uh, it's essentially average thunderstorm days per year, but thunderstorms of course produce lightning. Um, you see that Florida is the lightning capital of the country, um, almost the world. It's really high frequency of lightning there. You got two oh, uh, huge bodies of water on either side of that peninsula, different temperatures and storms rolling in from both sides, clashing over that peninsula. So Georgia is in that lightning zone though. You see that the high lightning incidence extends through the southeast and all the way into the Great Plains and up to the shortgrass prairie. So fire is important in all of those areas. And lightning has been starting fire since long before people got here. But people have been here since the last glaciation. Um, the, the Southeast has been well occupied by humans using fire and you know, setting fire to the landscape. Humans have been uh, using fire to manipulate uh, the, the woods and the things that live there for, since they've been here. Uh, Native Americans used fire to, uh, for hunting purposes, to drive game, to renew uh, certain things that they ate, such as uh, berries, blueberries especially, um, all sorts of reasons. They used it for some negative reasons too, and they probably just lost fire uh, sometimes because they were probably fairly casual when they were moving around with it. Um, I'm sure that there were arsonists among Native Americans as well. So, you know, there was a lot of fire getting started both from lightning and Native Americans since the plant communities down here evolved. Here you see uh, some maps showing uh, diversity of various groups of organisms. And I want you to focus on the column of maps that are down the center of uh, this slide. Uh, those, there's three columns. Uh, those endemic species, look how high the uh, endemic species are in the Southeast, right down the line. Mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, and fish and trees. We can kind of ignore the fish map because fish diversity isn't so closely tied to fire. But all the rest of those groups have some relationship with fire that is key to some of the reason why they're, they're so diverse in the southeastern United States. 
And really the, the Southeast has had fire so long that certain organisms have evolved really close relationships to that process. In this slide, you see a longleaf pine wiregrass sand hill plant community, a, a really kind of a you know, flagship plant community for uh, those that are very fire dependent. And both longleaf pine and wiregrass are considered sort of keystone species that uh, work together to move fire across the landscape when it occurs. They, they create a fuel bed that's very receptive to fire that creates a very continuous fire that doesn't have very many gaps in it. Um, they create a fire that's fairly gentle, one that they can both withstand and really benefit from. Essentially, they're controlling the competition in this plant community by promoting fire and its spread. So fire, therefore, is key to maintaining southeastern terrestrial diversity. And it's not all just in the coastal plain. This is a slide from Floyd County uh, in Georgia, sort of northwestern Georgia, uh, showing you that fire is kind of important all over the state for various plant communities. So if fire is happening or should be happening all over the state in natural places, then, you know, and, and it's key to maintaining our diversity, then we have to understand what is its relationship to our avifauna, our bird life. Yet, how could something like this be good for birds? You know, we've all seen in the news uh, video and photos of really devastating uh, fires. Fires that look so catastrophic, they look like they would, you know, sterilize the earth. Uh, and a fire like this really does kind of sterilize the earth. And there are a lot of things that don't get away from a fire like this. Um, birds included. Some birds would get burned up in this, although birds are uniquely uh, adapted to escaping any kind of cat catastrophe like this just because they can fly, most of them. Uh, so even in a fire like this, you know, a lot of the birds would escape, at least the birds that can fly. Now, you know, we're not all bird, not even all our birds can fly. We have a lot of flightless birds right now in Georgia called nestlings. Uh, and so, you know, we, we think uh, we, all our birds can fly. Not all our birds can fly, not right now. Um, so a lot of those would get burned up in a situation like this. This actually is arguably a natural fire. This, is, uh, this photo uh, is of a lodgepole pine uh, woodland or forest uh, out in the, the west, the mountain west. Those burn on very long rotations, you know, 150, 200 years, and they burn catastrophically. They burn up, and then they renew themselves with new seedlings. So, uh, you know, it's we don't have a lot of this kind of fire, though, in the southeast. We do have some plant communities that will burn fairly dramatically, um, but those are fairly patchy down here. Most of our fire is a ground fire. Um, most of our fire sort of looks like this. This actually is one of the hotter burning plant communities, a, a longleaf pine slash pine flatwoods with a lot of shrubs in the, in the, on the ground. And those shrubs burn fairly hot. So you can get flames in the 10 to 20 foot tall range, but still what's burning here is the stuff that lives on the ground, grasses and shrubs. Um, so our fires are not what we call stand replacement. It, we're not replacing the stand of trees that lives there. The trees survive, the trees persist, uh, and uh, don't get demonstrably damaged by the fire. The, everything that's on the ground burns up, and those things typically are perennials that re-sprout fairly quickly. So I wanna show you what fire looks like when it moves through the landscape and how quickly uh, the landscape recovers. Um, this little video is very short, and it shows you a time lapse over a two-month period. Uh, this is at Moody Forest in Appling County. So the fire flashes through, and wiregrass starts, starts re-sprouting and growing the next day. You can see it move, pushing out after a burn. That's a turkey oak in the foreground, re-sprouting. 
and a bit of squeeze the light in front of that. All right. I just wanted you to, I don't, I, a lot of you, maybe most of you, have never seen a ground fire move through a landscape. It's such a sort of a routine and pedestrian thing for me that uh, I forget that most people have never actually been on a fire. So um, you can see other time lapses of fire online. There's another video that we shot at Moody that is more of a from the trees viewpoint and you can find that on YouTube. Um, so, you know, our southeastern birds evolved in a, a pirate landscape. Um, we've, we've got a lot of birds that, that really are dependent on fire, not just brown-headed nuthatch. I mean, you know some of the other birds that are typically talked about. Northern Bob White, wild turkey is well adapted to fire, red cockaded woodpecker, uh, Henslow sparrow, uh, Backman sparrow, loggerhead shrike. Those are all birds that are fairly dependent on fire in the southeast. Um, some of those have shifted their uh, normal activity to really be associated with agriculture because there's just not much fire anymore and they've adapted to agricultural landscapes. But generally they also still live in any place that you know, is, is being managed uh, well with fire. Uh, we know that, for instance, loggerhead shrikes, um, perhaps many of you have seen loggerhead shrikes in a well-burned pine woodland. Uh, it's kind of nice. It really makes, gives you an idea of what their habitat used to be like. Um, but of course, most of the time we see them sitting on wires and uh, next to pastures, um, and we don't get to, uh, have that you know feeling of them as being a, a bird dependent on longleaf pine lands or pine lands in general. We know the loggerhead shrikes are great eaters of insects though uh, and I want to talk a little bit about fire's effect on insects and that is a very complex relationship. Unfortunately the literature is not very um, transparent regarding effects of fire on insect communities and numbers. Um, it's just a hard group of organisms to study in this regard because they're just too diverse. Too many things going on with insects. You can look at ants and you can find so many different responses. Ants that live in the ground, they go to ground. They're fine, ground nesting ants with fire. However, ants that are adapted to living in leaf litter, and there are some ants that are leaf litter specialists, can get really burned up during a fire uh, and, and their numbers can get really devastated. Likewise, ants that live in dead wood uh, can, uh, can be severely reduced during uh, burning. Um, so it's such a mixed bag, but some people have found that insect, insects respond marvelously after a fire. Insect diversity goes up after fire in one study. Um, certainly with the recovery of vegetation after a fire that you saw in that video, you would expect that insects would uh, you know, take advantage of that new resource. Um, just as anything else that eats plant matter, including herbivores, uh, such as deer, you know, they're, they're right there taking advantage of something that's freshly burned. So you know that herbivorous insects are gonna be doing the same thing. And those are the kinds of things that birds are taking advantage of when, they're, uh, when they move back into an area that's recently burned. One thing I have to keep reminding myself all the time when I'm managing land with fire is fire management deals with populations, not individuals. Uh, we can't, you know, name all of our Backman sparrows in a forest because we're going to be missing them otherwise. We're, we do uh, kill things because it's important for us managing these lands, and this is a bunch of wire grass in the foreground here, in this slide and the background for that matter. Um, wiregrass requires burning in the growing season in order to set viable seed. It's gotta burn in May and June. That tells you that it evolved in a system that typically did burn in May and June, what we call the lightning season. Uh, so if that is a, a, a regime 
that is good for a plant community, lightning season fire, you know, we're going to want to burn during those times. And therefore, we're going to be burning up some nestlings. Um, I have, I found myself one time dragging a drip torch through the middle of a, of a burn unit that looked very much like this. And a Bachman Sparrow, sorry, Bachman's, I have to keep reminding myself to pronounce it that way. A Bachman Sparrow came out in front of me and started doing a distraction display, kind of flopping along in the grass. And we all know as birders what that means. That means that I was really close to its nest. Um, and of course, wire grass burns very completely and continuously. No square inch of that was, was, not, was unaffected by fire. I burned up a bunch of Backman Sparrow nests that day, I think. And that was disheartening. It's, uh, I mean, I, you may think because I am a, a fire wheeler that I, have hardened my heart against that kind of stuff, but nope, uh, it's, it's hard to deal with. Um, but I, like I say, keep reminding myself, we're managing populations, not individual organisms. So how does a ground nesting bird like Backman Sparrow persist in a place that burns regularly, you ask yourself? Uh, well, uh, it's, it's 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 like this. They they can rapidly renest. They can they, their nest gets burned up. They immediately start building a new nest and and renest. And they they nest in the area that just got burned. Um, that's important for several reasons. It's it's an area that's going to have growing insect populations. And so uh, as those plants recover, you saw within a couple of months, they're it's really green. They will, uh, there'll be a lot of insects for them to feed on and feed their young with. Um, also, that area that just burned is the least likely area in that whole landscape to burn again during that nesting season. So they're avoiding losing that next nest by nesting in the area that just got burned. And that's an important thing to remember uh, about all these species that are adapted to fire. Um, they use those recently burned areas for a lot of reasons, but you know, one of the most important is that they're, they're not going to, uh, they're not, they're not going to lose that nest that they're putting in that area that just burned. Uh, when one study over 85% of Backman Sparrow nests in a five year period were in areas burned during the previous growing season. So Backman Sparrow, definitely preferentially nests in areas that have recently burned. We all know that red cockaded woodpecker is very adapted to living in old pine woodlands. Those old pine woodlands have to be managed with fire pretty much. You could mow them uh, and keep down all the competition and the other things that want to grow up in there with uh, in other ways, but Basically, most long uh, most red cockaded woodpecker habitat is managed with fire, um, and I mean that's true across its entire range. Uh, it's it's extremely fire adapted. It's theorized that they evolved in Central Florida, probably during a period when the Lake Wales Ridge was um, isolated and uh, essentially an island sitting off the southeast coast. Um, I'm sure that there was just as much lightning and fire then as there is now in that part of the world. Um, and so red cockaded woodpeckers had to adapt some way that all the dead trees were going away. They were getting burned up. You know, dead pines uh, frequently just catch fire and burn up uh, when we burn a landscape. So mostly what they've got are live trees. So they figured out a way to take advantage of old longleaf pine that get red heart disease. Um, it softens the heartwood in the tree and they can actually work their way in. It might take them two years to, to finish a cavity, but they can excavate a cavity in a living pine tree. Um, they can use that cavity over and over again, unlike just about any other woodpecker that would not use the same nest uh, twice. Um, well, you know, I don't know how they deal with the fact that mites build up in these nests, actually, but they have figured it out. 
uh, they, they will use the same nest over and over. Um, all the members of a, of a colony of red cockaded woodpeckers, um, each one has its own cavity that it uses at night. Uh, they have a so social structure that's fairly close to wolves. They have a breeding uh, pair, an alpha male and an alpha female. Then they have helper males, um, very variable number. Sometimes it's just the breeding pair. Sometimes they have several helpers and those helpers uh, really up the survivability of their young. They really uh, make, they, just by helping feed the young, they make the, the colony more successful. And uh, then they look for an opportunity to find their own place to breed at some point. If their father dies, the, 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 most, the, the top bird amongst the helpers takes up that slot and becomes the alpha male. So uh, they're, they're super adapted to fire. They, their nesting success increases if the forest underneath them burns. They, they will stop using an area if hardwoods begin to grow up and reach the level of their uh, cavity holes. So they're, they, they don't like any uh, you know, closed forest for nesting. It has to be very wide open. Uh, and that's a fire adapted landscape. That's a fire managed landscape. They're, they're probably our most fire adapted bird. Bob White are a very fire adapted species as well. Another species that we associate sometimes with agricultural landscapes because that's what they've got now in a lot of situations. But we know that in South Georgia and some other places too, uh, in the Piedmont for instance, such as Piedmont National Wildlife Refuge, but mostly in South Georgia, you know, the areas that get burned have really good populations of Bob White. Um, you can go into some of these big fire managed landscapes and you hear Bob White calling all over the place. For instance, down in um, the Thomasville area where you have all those big quail hunting plantations, they do fire all the time because they're managing for Bob White. Um, but even when we're not specifically managing for Bob White, such as uh, some of the big WMAs where they do a lot of fire, uh, we get them anyway. They, they come in and, and they really are successful in areas that get, get burned regularly. That's true across the state, almost everywhere in the state except the mountains. Grassland birds, as you probably heard, are generally in decline. Um, there are uh, few exceptions to that rule, and it's uh, very disappointing to hear uh, about some of the declines that we see. Some species like Henslow sparrows tied to grasslands in two different landscapes. They nest in prairies, tall grass prairies, uh, and then they come down in winter and winter in our flatwoods in the southeast. And so their, their habitat is getting hit on both sides. You know, they've got two different grasslands that they depend on and uh, very little of it's getting burned on either side of that equation. Um, so, you know, it's habitat loss, it's habitat mismanagement. Um, they're, they're getting hit by a lot of different problems. And we see that fire helps these birds. We, we can, it's the relationships are pretty easy to establish that uh, when fire happens, you know, these species increase. It's true in the, on the wintering grounds and on the breeding grounds. So it's, we, we have a fairly clear mandate what we need to do to, to help the situation. Uh, we, you know, we start thinking about fire ecology in a lot of different ways when we're doing burning. And, Thinking about the seasonality of fire is, is something we do. For plant communities, the most important thing is to burn them, but it's best to also do some fire in the growing season. We really want to push growing season fire because it, it's the best way to restore plant communities to their natural high diversity state. So what that means is you're, you are killing some nestlings, but you know, one, one quote uh, about this is uh, from a, a paper published in 2009. By affecting their habitat quality or by affecting their nesting effort, many bird species re-nest. And the indirect benefits of habitat alteration are usually far more important and likely compensate 
or more than compensate for losses. So we're by, by improving their habitat, we're giving them better nesting opportunities for so many of our species in the Southeast. And there's so few birds and they're usually fairly common birds that, that do well without fire completely. The, some of our most beloved and important birds and rare birds really depend on fire. So as in the few areas that we can do it, it's very important that we, that we get these landscapes burned up regularly. Um, I think uh, the net benefit is, is very positive for birds in total. If you really want to look a little deeper into this, I would suggest you, you go to Google Scholar and just type in effects of growing season fire on birds and you'll come up with a lot of papers and you can you know shop around in there if you want to read more about there's several papers from the southeast on how birds benefit from fire and you know you can learn very specific things about you know how do turkeys deal with fire going through their uh, habitats while they're nesting there are several different ways that turkeys deal with that that issue um, and you know, you can fire can go right around a nest, and that nest can still all hatch. Pretty amazing, actually. So um, I would I really encourage you to look more deeply into this. Uh, in Georgia, we we've created a fairly innovative group of uh, burning agencies and groups that, that all sorts of nonprofits and uh, federal and state agencies get together. We plan out fire. We talk about our just finished fire season. We cooperate with one another fairly seamlessly uh, across agencies. Uh, we, we depend on one another for to staff fires because it's important to have um, enough people on these burns. So, um, you know, if, if you have lots of different people you can call on to help you do a burn very safely, um, that's, that's pretty critical to, to, to doing this. That, it's, it's really important for us to, um, to do fire absolutely safely. We, that's, it's one of the top things that for us. And so one of the things we do is we, uh, we make sure that we're compliant with all the laws. We, we're a member of the National Wildfire Coordinating Group. Um, the Nature Conservancy is, and so we have to comply with all their standards just as federal agencies do for applying fire. And we, you know, think that's the safest way to, to get fire done. Of course, Nature Conservancy as a big organization has hot and cold running lawyers, and it's very important to them that we do fire extremely safely and don't have accidents with it. So being well-trained, following all the right regulations and uh, complying with all the rules is, is, is key to doing it properly. And in Georgia, I just want to put in a plug for the birding community. Um, truly, the um, I think birders are always the core of the environmental community. They, birders, you know, support environmental organizations. They support the agencies. Uh, such as uh, DNR, um, that are getting a lot of fire done. Um, so I, I think that is key to us continuing this. Um, George Ornithological Society, I'll put in a little plug for them. They're, they've actually directly funded a lot of uh, fire management in Georgia um, with their fairly deep pockets. So um, that's been very welcome over the last decade or so. As a result of that, and just because of our own understanding of the importance of fire, fire uh, activity in Georgia has really increased um, over the last 20 years. Uh, you can see all these different colors are marching upward. Uh, the green is the Nature Conservancy, the red are uh, people, the partners that we burn with in the state. And if you were able to look, if I had a slide showing what DNR is doing, it's very impressive more impressive than our numbers. They have multiple teams around the state. 
um, doing fire and truly uh, I'm so impressed with our DNR and, and what they're able to accomplish every year in Georgia. I, those people are so tireless and so dedicated. And I'm talking about people like Nathan Klaus, Shan Kamek, um, you know, the, the, the fire leaders that they have on staff, all the fire teams that they hire. We, uh, the Nature Conservancy has generally five fire teams every uh, late winter and spring. Uh, you see on this slide that we have uh, these orange polygons around the state that where, we're, where we concentrate fire and have teams that we hire just to do fire. We also have a team up in the Blue Ridge Mountains that does fire every year now. And some of those teams are still on staff right now. We've actually been burning through the pandemic. Um, forestry and land management is considered an essential activity in Georgia. And uh, so we've been taking advantage of that sentiment by uh, continuing to be in the woods. So here's some future challenges for us. Uh, we we want to get people, especially people who are very much set in a winter burning mindset to, to, to use fire in all seasons, but especially the lightning season, uh, May and June. And so we always push growing season fire as a tool for habitat restoration and management. Um, it's, it's, it's a challenge though. Um, people are, are set in their ways. Uh, there, there are certain groups that feel safer burning in the wintertime. Um, and it just, it's an educational process. It's slow change, but it's incremental. We're, uh, there's you know, been a lot of turnover uh, and we keep training people in how to burn well. And we're, those people are moving up. So we're seeing some of the benefits of that. We need to support more science on uh, investigating fire facts, especially birds that aren't necessarily totally dependent on fire, but you know, can live in areas that burn. And we need to know more about the effects of fire on those species. Um, we need to support studies refining fire practices, especially in some of these hard to burn places, places that burn hot or burn only very seldom. You know, some of these places might only burn every 20 or 30 years. So we need to understand how to apply fire in those places. And, and we need to figure out how to continue to help private landowners uh, apply fire. It's, it's hard for us because our hands are full burning our own landscapes that we own or have easements on or we have close relationships with partners. Um, all these folks that need fire, it's, uh, it's difficult to, to figure out how to help them get that done. And so with that, I will leave you with this slide. These are, these are black kites circling over a fire in Australia. And uh, you know, you've heard the stories probably about uh, black kites being observed picking up burning sticks and dragging them for ways and then setting another fire. I, I, I'll have to see that to believe it, to tell you the truth. But, uh, and I doubt it's a very significant spreader of fire, but it's an interesting story. Um, and there are relationships between birds and fire all over the world. Some of them are pretty complicated, like this one. So I uh, appreciate your letting me talk about Georgia's birds and fire today and happy to entertain any questions you have. If anybody has questions, please um, type them in the chat box and we'll try to get to them. Malcolm, do we know why bobwhite quail dust themselves with ash? Oh yeah, it's uh, ash is great for dealing with parasites. I think it's it's very caustic, um, and I'm sure that mites and uh, other things that are pest pestering the them, like maybe uh, hippobosket flies and things like that, would be very irritated by uh, ash dusting, and probably helps reduce their parasite load. Um, someone says a place like FDR State Park comes to mind as a place that definitely needs fire, but it isn't being applied due to misunderstandings. What strategies are being used in places where fire is hard due to education gaps? 
You know, we're, uh, those are some tough nuts to crack. Uh, we've got some cultural issues with burning at FDR. Um, we've had some, some real roadblocks thrown in our way. It's such an obvious fire landscape, uh, but um, people who have influence there are keeping fire out of that landscape. I think it would be good for us to try to get our toe in there and find a little patch that is unimportant to those people who are anti-fire in the park that we can start burning and just start creating a place that is managed with fire so that we can use it as a demonstration. But honestly, I, I, I've, we've talked about that in the past. I, don't, I still don't even know if that would work. Um, we have more places that are accepting of fire than places that are anti-fire around the state. Uh, that's, a, that's a kind of a, uh, a glaring hole in our fire management, FDR, since it's our biggest state park um, and has, you know, a lovely stand of Montane longleaf pine on it that are really in need of fire. Can't hear you, Dottie. Are you talking? Yeah, what Gus Kaufman wants to know, what was the warbler that was yellow with white wing bars and indistinct black on the sides of the breast? If it was a magnolia, I'm not sure which slide he was talking about. Maybe Gus is talking, I had a, a shot of a prairie warbler in there. And prairie warblers, of course, are, are great uh, firebirds. They, they love grass, grassy areas, especially grassy areas with young trees in them. One, area, one habitat type that they have turned to using in the absence of fire is young pine plantations, which of course with our short rotation pine uh, industry in Georgia, we have a lot of young pine plantations always, but it's an ephemeral habitat. It becomes good for a few years and then is no longer any good. So, uh, you know, it's nice to hear uh, prairie warblers in areas that are getting regularly managed with fire. We know that that's a place they can continue using right along. Um, somebody asked if there are any controlled fires burns in Atlanta. No, because the metro area has uh, air quality issues that prevent us doing much fire in the Atlanta metro area. Um, I will, I will sh say I got on a Panola Mountain State Park t-shirt right now, uh, strategically worn, because that's just about the only place in the metro area that's doing regular landscape uh, application of fire. Um, and I, I mean, I'm so glad they kind of are able to work around all the regs. Uh, it's just that, you know, the air quality in Atlanta being a big city has been fairly poor and there is this uh, really wor a worry that the smoke generated by landscape scale fire would that's why, you know, we have a burn ban every year because we just can't deal with the smoke in Atlanta. So basically, um, we, we don't manage land with fire in the metro area. And of course, the metro area continues to grow. Um, what was the time period on the video you showed, the time lapse? It was two months. So it, it greened up that much in two months. Truly, halfway through that video, it was already pretty green. So really in a month, everything's very green. Okay, you mentioned that fire helps control competition, but then you also say it promoted diversity. Is it used to control competition in monocultures? Well, I was talking about two different things there. Uh, the plants, uh, and I'm speaking very anthropomorphically here, they, they promote fire in order to cut down on their competition. So basically what those pines don't want is for a, a hardwood forest to grow up. And that's what we see happen so often in Georgia when fire is excluded from a landscape. We see uh, it become dominated by sweet gums and water oaks, which are native hardwoods, but they're very weedy and they move in very quickly into areas that don't burn. So um, that's the competition that the, the plants are trying to control. And then when I was talking about insects, uh, in one study it was shown that insect diversity increased. Certainly plant diversity increases with fire too because in a longleaf pine or any kind of pine woodland system, the diversity is concentrated in the ground cover. That's where all those plants that live down there, grasses and graminoids and herbs of all kinds, that's, that's the diversity in that system. Uh, the canopy is fairly low diversity. There's only a few species of trees growing in a, 
a woodland like that, but so many species of plants in the ground cover. You're muted, Dottie. Somebody asked, why can't controlled burns be done in February before many of the songbirds are nesting? Well, we do burn in February. It's part of our burn season, certainly. Uh, we, we call those dormant season fires. Um, the problem is that a lot of our plants that live in these woodlands are adapted to getting uh, growing season fire. Um, even though, you know, you look at them and say, well, you mean you're going to burn those pitcher plants while they're blooming? How can that be good for the pitcher plants? But all those plant communities, you know, they're adapted to fire at that particular season. And it's probably because that's when most of the lightning occurred. And that's when most of the fires occurred before even there were any humans on the landscape. Once humans were part of the equation, and that happened about 10 plus thousand years ago on this continent, fires started happening more frequently in any season. I mean, humans would burn in the fall for certain reasons, uh, you know, set fires in the winter and the spring and the summer, all over the time. But, but, you know, still those lightning fires were occurring, even with humans on the landscape. So the preponderance of fire was probably still in May and June, even with Native Americans setting fires themselves. Um, that's natural fire. That's when we get the highest diversity of all kinds on a landscape, when we, when we burn regularly at that season. Um, and that's how we get our, you know, keystone species like wiregrass and longleaf pine to prosper by burning at that season. Uh, we also see some plants predominate when, uh, that we don't necessarily want when we burn in the winter. Um, those are, you know, generally milder burns and it's harder for us to restore land, uh, get rid of hardwoods that compete with our pines. So it's important for many reasons. We do wind up burning some nestling birds. We have to live with that when we burn in the growing season because we keep reminding ourselves we're managing populations, not individuals, and populations increase when we burn. Okay, um, somebody asked, said, I didn't know about burning in, in the Blue Ridge area. How is that area different from South Georgia with regards to fire? Well, uh, the, anytime you have a mountain landscape, you have extreme complexity in the plant communities that grow there because you have uh, dramatic changes with elevation, with aspect, which way the, the plant community is facing on the tree, with hydrology, um, with climate, because even when you move up uh, in on mountains, you you know you're sort of going north uh, by going uphill. Um, so there, there's so much complexity up there that fire is itself an extremely complex process in the mountains. Um, we we haven't figured out entirely how to get fire up there in all the ways that it would be best for those plant communities, but we know because there's some extremely fire adapted plants in the mountains, such as pitch pine and table mountain pine. Um, you know, some of the plant communities up there, the uh, pine, oak, hickory, uh, blueberry type or heath uh, woodlands. Those are extremely important uh, areas for diversity and they, they require fire. Also, some of our species in the mountains benefit tremendously from fire. I don't know if y'all noticed me using ruffed grouse in the background but, uh, of one of my slides, but ruffed grouse you know, do great in brushlands that have been burned a, a few years ago. So, um, What Georgia public lands would you recommend to explore longleaf pine stands? Oh, um, I think uh, one place that is uh, underutilized by people who just appreciate uh, nature and also by birders is Moody Forest WMA. Um, if Moody Forest has some of the only uh, pine lands, longleaf pine lands that we consider old growth uh, in, the, in southeast Georgia, there's a fair number of uh, stands in southwest Georgia, but a lot of those are privately owned. The nice thing about Moody is uh, it's publicly owned and there's a nice hiking trail that will lead you to some old growth longleaf pine land. Uh, they're 
when we got Moody Forest back in the early 2000s, um, there was one colony of red cockaded woodpeckers, but with good management, that has increased. And now uh, we have, I don't know, four or five breeding pairs of red cockaded woodpeckers there now. That sounds fairly small when you talk about a place like a big population like Fort Stewart or Fort Benning, but it's a big improvement for us from one to five. And, uh, you know, it's not unusual to have red cockaded woodpeckers fly through an area you're walking through when you're at Moody Forest nowadays, which is lovely. Um, there's the plant, the bird community there is really rich and uh, it's a delightful place to, to bird. So I would suggest uh, Moody Forest, look into it, look it up online, Moody Forest WMA. And uh, there's a, you will tell you about the hiking trail and everything. Okay, if fire from lightning was once common, was it, do you consider naturally started fire common, common now? Why do we need to start these fires in a controlled manner? Well, uh, natural fires still occur. Uh, <laughs> Georgia Forestry Commission has to put out a lot of lightning fires every year. Um, and so lightning fires are still out there. We just actively suppress them. Another thing that we do is, you know, chop the landscape up with clearings and roads and uh, fire breaks of all kind. So fire is not allowed to progress across the landscape uh, like it once was. Fires used to move, you know, for days, just burning thousands of acres of land, only stopped by really major rivers, sometimes not even then. Uh, so it's, you know, fires used to move around in ways we can't even fathom now. Uh, and and persist for long periods until maybe a front moved through and uh, they were doused by rainfall. Uh, so that's how a lot of the landscape got burned and got burned, you know, fairly regularly, at least every one to three years in much of South Georgia. Um, is controlled burning used in other parts of the world with similar habitats? Australia does a lot of fire. Um, I think that there's growing interest in prescribed fire in Latin America. There's, there's a lot of uh, cross-pollination between burners. Uh, we, we, you know, different various groups train Latin American fire folk uh, in ecological fire in the United States. Um, they're, they're always looking for people who are uh, fire professionals who can speak Spanish to help, part, help in those trainings. Um, Really, you know, Europe has some really fire adapted landscapes, but it also has a very high density of humans and not very much tradition of burning. There are exceptions to that, but uh, especially in Mediterranean countries, you know, you've got dry uh, heathlands and pinelands that would really benefit from fire, but uh, there's not much fire that goes on there. There's a lot of inappropriate fire that happens around the world, like, uh, slash and burn practices in Southeast Asia and Africa and Latin America. We've heard a lot about the stuff in Brazil of late. Uh, this, that all seems like ages ago, doesn't it? But it was only within the last year that there were all those devastating fires were in the Amazon where they really don't belong. There's a lot of South America that does naturally burn. You know, a lot of those uh, grasslands, those seasonally wet grasslands need fire. What are survival tactics of reptiles and amphibians? Do they bury or run? Yeah, they do all of the above. Uh, they climb, they, they burrow. Uh, one of the most important keystone animals in longleaf pinelands are gopher tortoises. And they create uh, an escape route for a lot of organisms during fire. Uh, they themselves, you know, are safe in their burrow when a burn goes overhead. Rarely do we see a burned up go for tortoise. It's happened, but uh, they have their little burrow to get into, and a lot of other things climb in there with them during fire. Even birds will go into a go for tortoise burrow during a burn uh, to, to sit it out. So uh, that's important. Uh, a lot of reptiles go underground. You know, a lot of the, the reptiles we really associate with those systems, like uh, coral snakes, they, bur they, they're, they burrow into the sand and escape the fire that way. Um, you know, you often see things doing stupid things like a, one time I was burning and a rattlesnake 
kept trying to cross the break and go into the burn, the area that we were burning. And I kept using my fire rake to lift him out and move him out of the burn. And he just wouldn't take no for an answer. And finally, I just let him go in. And he probably figured out how to, you know, find his way to his favorite burrow that he was getting to, hopefully. But uh, anyway, you know, uh, we kill things. I won't deny that. We find uh, reptiles dead after we burn sometimes. Uh, it's important to do patchy burns. It's important not to set fire to uh, an entire unit at the same time because it's really difficult for things to escape fire that way. Um, you know, you, burners can burn in ways that help animals escape. They can provide escape routes. They can do it so that uh, things can, can more easily get away. How does, um, wait, hold on, I lost my question. Um, is fire of any benefit to mammals? Oh, yeah. Uh, fire is, is, is hugely important to some mammals. Um, we don't have the mammal diversity we once had in Georgia, and we have some unwelcome mammal diversity. Um, all these bipedal mammals really uh, don't benefit very much from fire. But, um, you know, here's an example of a, of a species that really depends on fire, a fox squirrel. So the coastal plain races of fox squirrel are generally, you know, most often found in areas that burn frequently. Um, you can go into some of these well-burned landscapes and see some amazing huge fox squirrels. They love longleaf pine cones uh, to eat, and uh, they also love some of the oaks that are in those areas. So um, that's a species that benefits from fire. A lot of mammals don't have much relationship with fire. Uh, the the whole Bambi thing, of course, is uh, is pyrophobic mythology. Um, the, all the all the mammals, you know, racing away from the fire. Uh, I've uh, seen mammals during fires. Uh, deer are fast and they run away from any fire we set uh, quite effectively. Um, I've, uh, you know, seen bobcats getting a little freaked out by fire in the past, but uh, they're also a quick animal and can jump, climb, and uh, get away from just about anything. So I don't think, you know, uh, mammals have negative relationships with fire. Any plant community that is very rich and complex and diverse is going to provide opportunities for things to, uh, to, to, to be more successful. Deer, uh, you know, people create f food plots for deer, but when you burn an area, the herb community is so rich, the whole thing is a food plot, and deer carrying capacities uh, go up with, uh, in areas that are well burned. So more, it, those areas can support more deer. And of course, deer are uh, uh, something that, you know, predators eat, including humans. How effective is fire at decreasing invasive plants? Do we have any invasive species that actually survive or thrive after fire? Yeah, it's, it, it goes species by species on that. Um, fire can be used to control certain things. Uh, it definitely kills privet, thin bark things, but privet generally grows in places that don't burn well. It, it likes, you know, wetlands. So we don't do a lot of effective privet control, unfortunately, with fire. Um, you've got some species that really benefit from fire. If you invade, some invasive grasses do quite well uh, with fire. One species we don't deal a lot with in Georgia because we keep it under control is Kogon grass, but in areas where it's a really pro a real big problem such as Florida and Alabama and Mississippi, uh, when they burn a unit with Kogon grass in it, the Kogon grass is invigorated by the fire and it grows faster after a fire than it would normally. So uh, it's, it's a mixed bag. It's, it depends on the species you're talking about. Um, Generally, we think of fire as helping us uh, as long as we're not dealing with something like Kogon grass uh, with our invasive species in a unit. You know, it, it can knock back things like Japanese honeysuckle, uh, China berry. Um, let's see, uh, 
you know, some of the other, some of the invasive shrubs that we deal with, like uh, um, the Eliagnuses, stuff like that. Okay, uh, what is the role of the Georgia Forestry Commission in controlled fire? Well, they're the, uh, you know, the, the forestry agency in Georgia. If you see their little logo, one of the blocks is fire. So they're, they're primarily responsible for wildland fire suppression in the state. Um, they're out there, you know, they're equipped with their fire plows and their other uh, equipment, fire engines or putting out fires. And um, however, you know, some, and it varies with the, uh, the unit. Some of them are very much into helping people put, uh, conduct control burns on their land. Um, they're, they're very active with fire. Some uh, county units are not very active with fire. They're only about suppression. And so we, uh, it's a, mixed bag, but generally the, the statewide organization, the folks in Macon are supportive of a prescribed fire and they, they really try to help us get uh, things done. And they're an active member in the, uh, our, our burn cooperative that we have in Georgia, the IBT, the Interagency Burn Team. So we consider uh, Georgia Forestry Commission to be a key partner in our application of fire in the state. You know, they're the people we call in the morning when we want a burn permit to get a fire done. And uh, they're they're you know letting us burn and getting letting us get our our mission accomplished in that way. What was the weirdest bird that you ever had show up in a tortoise burrow? <laughs> I've I personally have never seen a bird in a gopher tortoise burrow, but you know there are people who do gopher tortoise research that shove cameras down in burrows and they see birds. You know I I think uh, wrens are are probably uh, birds that frequently investigate bird uh, gopher tortoise burrows, especially around the mouth of the burrow, just because that's what wrens do. You know, they climb into stuff and looking for bugs and spiders. Um, and so I think probably wrens and sparrows probably are frequent users of uh, those burrows. Um, and be any anything I would say beyond that, I would be making up. How does Georgia compare to other states in controlled fire? Georgia is one of the leaders in the country. We're in the, generally in the top five uh, for control burning um, in, the, in the country. So, so we, we're, we're, we're fighting the good fight in Georgia. Uh, we're right up there with, you know, states like Florida, Alabama, Oklahoma, big burning states. Um, what about fire in the Okie Pinocchio? Do you have any updates on that? No, uh, fire is a necessary uh, and natural process in the Okefenokee. The Okefenokee, most of it is a wilderness area, and those fires generally start on their own via lightning. And that's one of the few landscapes in the state that where fire is often let burn uh, until it reaches the perimeter of the refuge. And uh, as devastating as fires can seem to be in the Okefenokee, the reason why there are open, uh, you know, areas out there, there are lakes and meadows and really complex uh, areas in the Okefenokee is because of fire. If, if fire didn't occur in the Okefenokee, eventually the whole thing would fill up with peat and it would be a closed forest. And there would be so little bird diversity there, It'd be like three species of birds red crested flycatchers, northern parallas, and prothonotary warblers. But, you know, as a result of fire, we have things like uh, nesting sandhill cranes and ducks and egrets and bitterns and um, all kinds of things that use the oaky. So fire is absolutely necessary there for plant diversity, bird diversity, everything. Okay, what states are in the forefront of controlled fire? Well, uh, Florida is always one of the leaders and, and the fire culture in the Southeast United States was really preserved in Florida. And some would argue, oh, in Georgia too, but in that sort of Thomasville, Tallahassee nexus, um, that, those people that were studying fire there and burning the landscape were the people who got us through the Smokey the Bear era. 
uh, the, the active government propaganda against fire, where you know people went around bar barnstorming through the southeast, telling people that if they set fire to the woods, um, they were essentially allies of Satan. And uh, we thankfully have gotten through that, and now we know that that's not true, and uh, that fire is absolutely necessary. But those folks in Florida and Tallahassee and, and Thomasville, they got us through that. Florida is always important with fire. It's one of the most active uh, prescribed burning uh, states, and uh, so many odd plant communities down there that need fire, and prairies, and you know, rock pine lands, all kind of stuff. Okay, that segues nicely into the next question. What is the argument that states use against controlled burning? Well, uh, really, uh, a lot of Western states just can't figure out how to get started with it. Uh, they don't have fire cultures. They don't have people who are experienced with doing fire. They're essentially afraid of it. They don't have enough experience to do it. Their, their uh, citizenry are against it because they're afraid of it too. Uh, they're afraid. And sometimes when out west, you know, within these areas that have long needed fire, they've tried to apply fire, they haven't done it right, they lose the fire. And then once again, you know, control burners out west get a black eye. Uh, oh, you started this, you know, I can't believe you, you set fire to our home. And uh, so essentially it's, there's so many things coming into not you know, us not applying fire in some of these areas that need it so badly, especially out west. It's, it's a tough thing to crack. There's so many good people working on that problem and uh, obviously not solving it. Okay, last one, I think. How does fire move through old growth, undisturbed pine forests versus old field forests? Old field forests typically have a fairly low diversity ground cover, but in time, they, 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 they achieve a sort of a rough simulation of a natural pine forest, pine woodland, I will say. A woodland is open, has a lot of sunlight in the ground, allows grass to grow. Eventually, grasses like blue stems will uh, move into those areas and fire can be applied. Those blue stems benefit from growing season fire too, with better reproduction. They're not as tied to growing season fire as something like wire grass. But those habitats are important. A lot of our hunting lands in the state are old field lands uh, that have a fairly low diversity of herb cover, yet they will carry fire. They have pine trees. They may not be the best pine tree. It might be loblolly or slash pine. Uh, but as long as it's open enough and mature enough, a lot of things can live in there. A lot of even interesting things can live in those places. And they provide good connecting habitats, especially to places that are actually high diversity and natural. Uh, one more. Um, for, for somebody who has land and might like to get fire on it, how would they go about that? I guess a private property owner must be what they're talking about. Um, well, there are some ways. You can call your county uh, uh, or your local uh, Georgia Forestry Commission office and see if they are a, a unit that does much in the way of helping people put fire on the ground. Um, you should research it a bit. Um, look at Georgia Forestry Commission's website. They have a lot of resources there for people who want to burn. They help you understand things like how to plan a burn, how to do it safely. Um, the state does a, a certification program for private landowners that helps them learn all the ways to be safe and understand the weather and the relationship of weather with fire. And that's key to doing fire safely is knowing what sort of weather day to look for uh, to get fire done. You're muted, Dottie. I think that's all the questions. If anybody has any more, please type them in the chat box. But Malcolm, thank you very much. That was very enlightening. I enjoyed that. 
Um, yeah. We will be record. We are recording this session, and we'll give us a day or two, and we'll have it up on our website. If you know anybody else who might like to listen to this, um, we'll have it up on our website in probably 24 to 48 hours. Um, so thank you guys for coming, and Malcolm, thank you very much. You all enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Mal. Have a good day. Thanks, everybody. Cheers.